Hello, and welcome back to semantics. In, in the previous lecture, we saw how to define syntax with binding as sort of preparation for, uh, uh, for studying functions. So to recap, what we did was we introduced the syntax of functions into our programming language. And functions are expressions that have formal parameters. And so whenever you call a function, you give it some arguments, and those arguments st uh, are uh, stand in for all the, the, the formal parameters stand in for those arguments in the expression. So when you evaluate a function, you want to take your arguments and substitute them for the formal parameters. And so to model these formal parameters, we first had to introduce the idea of binding, and then once you have a bound variable, one of the formal parameters, you should be allowed to rename the uh, the formal parameters without changing the meaning of an expression. And so what we did was we introduced the idea of alpha equivalence to mean uh, in order to model this. So we said that a, a term with a binder in it is equivalent to a term with a with a renamed binder and we gave the rules for re renaming renaming the variables in a consistent way and we showed how these were related to uh, what's called de brown notation where every variable is replaced with a pointer back to its binding site and so now what happens is that uh, uh, once you have a coherent notion of alpha equivalence, you can use it to define the notion of substitution, which is replacing a variable with a term. And we have to do this in a way that uh, substituting a term doesn't interfere with any of the new bi uh, binders that, that exist. And so after defining that, we are now finally ready to define how uh, functions work. And so we've defined substitution, and so what we expect is for uh, arguments to be substituted in for the formal parameters. And because in L1, in L2 now, because in L2 uh, expressions and statements have no distinction from one another, we can, so, uh, we can place expressions in the position of a formal parameter. And so this immediately raises some issues of what do you, of how do you implement it? And so if you look at this expression here, we have fn x colon unit goes to L gets set to one, semicolon x, and you give it the argument L gets assigned to two. The question is, what does this mean? And if you think about it in terms of, well, I'm substituting my uh, argument for the formal parameter, what you, ex what you might expect, so here's one, one thing that could happen. You could think, okay, I have fn x colon unit, it goes to L gets set to one semicolon x, and I'm going to give it the argument L gets set to two. And so if we take this expression here and we substitute it for x, what we would expect is for this to become L gets set to one followed by L gets set to two. And so you would expect that if you actually ran this program, at the end of it, L would be set to 2. And that's a reasonable expectation, but is it the only one? And if you've done, if you've done programming in languages like ML or Java, you might, uh, you might see what I'm saying is a bit uh, improbable. Let's actually try it. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a little bit of OCaml code. So let's first define our location. Let's initialize it to zero. And so we have a integer reference whose contents are zero. And so now what we can do is let's uh, write L gets set to one, and now we will put in X. And what we'll do is we'll set X to two, okay? And now when we run this, we get unit as we expect because everything has been evaluated. So in our, uh, in our L2, we represent the unit by the skip term rather than the uh, open close parentheses. But let's look at L. And its contents are one. So instead of being 
instead of evaluating, substituting L gets assigned to 2 for x, OCaml is doing something that's a bit different. And so this brings up the idea of evaluation order. So what OCaml is doing is, in fact, it's evaluating L gets assigned to 2 first, so then L is 2, and then it passes this unit for to x, and now the body of the function sets L to 1 and then returns the unit. So we get 1 as the contents, uh, as the contents of L. And so this means that when we have state in our programming language, the order we evaluate expressions in can affect the meaning of the program. And so in a language like uh, Java, the, the language specification actually has to specify what the evaluation order is. And in Java, it says it must be left to right evaluation order. Okay, and so the, this, this strategy that a language like uh, Java uses is what's called the call by value evaluation strategy. And intuitively what it's saying is that we want to e evaluate the left hand side of an expression to a function, we evaluate the argument to a value, and only after the argument is a value do we replace all the formal parameter of occurrences with that value. And so in this case, what will happen, what, what an ML-like language is doing, what a Java-like language is doing, is it's saying, well, I have uh, this expression, fn x colon x colon unit to L, L gets assigned to 1 semicolon x, L gets assigned to 2, and what we're going to do is first we're going to evaluate the L gets assigned to 2 statement. And so now we have fn x colon unit to L, to one, L gets assigned to 1 semicolon x, and we have the unit, the unit value skip as the argument. And the state gets updated to 2. Then what we do is we substitute skip for x, and the program evaluates by substitution to L gets assigned to 1, and then skip. And the state is still 2. And then what we have is we evaluate this L gets assigned to 1, and when we evaluate that, the state goes from L being 2 to L being 1. And then we have two skip sequences, and those will eventually evaluate to skip. And so that's how call by value evaluation works. But that's not the only way that, uh, uh, of that uh, programs can be evaluated. But before we see those, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we would formalize L2, uh, call by value in our L2 language. So recall that in L2, our values are booleans, numbers, units, that's the skip, and functions, functions x colon tau to e. And so the way that we're going to specify the evaluation of functions is by giving a pair of congruence rules for the uh, uh, application and then we'll say how to actually do a reduction. And so the application one rule captures this idea that we want to evaluate the function the function first. So if you see an application e1, e2, the first thing you do is you see can e1 step to e1 prime. And if e1 can step to e1 prime, then the application e1, e2 will go to e1 prime e2. So we're evaluating the left hand side first. And then, to, uh, the evaluating the argument, it says, well, if e2 goes to e2 prime, and the function, the function position is already a value, then v e2 will go to v e prime 2. And so, what's happening here is that because values don't evaluate can't evaluate at all, we can't uh, apply the app2 rule until we've finished evaluating the function position. And so we use the app1 rule to evaluate the function position, and then when we're done with that, we can, we're only now are we allowed to use the app2 rule to evaluate the argument position. And when both the function position and the argument position are values, then we can actually do the substitution. So if we see fn x colon t goes to e and it's applied to v and, it, and v is applied to that function, then we do the substitution. We substitute v for x into the body e. 
And so that's that's what sort of drives the evaluation of this uh, of a call by value evaluation strategy. We we proceed by evaluating the function position, evaluating the argument position, and then when both of those are as evaluated as they can get, we only then do we do the substitution and call and actually do the function call. And so what you can see here is that uh, evalu uh, reduction happens in like sort of a sequence of steps here. So let's see how this goes. So if we have fn x goes to fn y goes to x plus y, and we give it two arguments, 3 plus 4 and 5, then what's going to happen is we can view this as being uh, parenthesized as we have a, in the function position, we have an application. Uh, x to y to x plus y, and it has the argument 3 plus 4. And then that whole thing has the argument 5. And so now we can use the app1 rule to evaluate this expression right here, the, the uh, fn x y to x plus y, and 3 plus, with 3 plus 4 as an argument. And when we do that, we see that this function is already a value. And so we can use the app2 rule in here to take the 3 plus 4 to a 7. And now again we can use the reduction rule to substitute 7 for x, and now we get the function fn y to 7 plus y, and it has the argument 5. And so when we substitute 5 for y, because 5 is already a value, we get 7 plus 5 comma s, and that evaluates to 12. And so the the point is that um, many of the many uh, the ma many uh, applications in a call by value language can be nested. So in uh, language like ML, uh, functions are curried, and when you see an application, they're actually like nested function applications. And this thing even comes up in languages like um, Java and JavaScript these days because you can write functions which return functions, and the, the result of this is that you have to use the left associativity of application in order, to, uh, in order to figure out which gets evaluated first. So this is an issue for the parser. Once you actually have the syntax tree, you're, you don't need to worry about the, about the associativity. But when you're reading these programs as a human, it's helpful to remember that application is left associative. Okay, and so the way that uh, higher order functions work is exactly the same. There's no difference at all between passing a, a number as an argument and passing a function as an argument. So if we have a higher order function, like fn f goes to f applied to 3, and we have a function of type int to int, fn x goes to 1 plus 2 plus x, now what we're going to do when we, in order to do this reduction is, well, this is a function and this is a value because functions are values and you can do the substitution. And you'll get 1 plus 2, fn x goes to 1 plus 2 plus x and it will have the argument 3. And then you do one more substitution and now you have a pure arithmetic expression that can evaluate to 6. But as I said before, we had to make a choice of the evaluation strategy. There are other evaluation strategies possible. And so the idea with the, the other, one of the other evaluation strategies that was historically used is what's called call by name. And so the idea of call by name is first, we reduce a, when you see an application, you reduce the left hand side to a function, just like with call by value, but then you immediately substitute the argument without evaluating it first. And so when we see this expression here, we, would, we wouldn't evaluate L gets assigned to 2, we would just substitute it. And so what you would see is that E, this application, would evaluate to L gets set to 1, semicolon L gets sign, assigned to 2. And now what would happen is with this sequence of assignments, first we would set the location to 1, and then we would set the location to 2, and so we would end in a state where the location L is mapped to 2. And in call by value, it would have had the value 1. And this, this was actually the original semantics of functions back in... 1959 and 1960. So the Algol programming language was the first programming language that uh, had a language specification which specified how uh, 
how functions should work. And the way that they the way that they specified it was actually by call by name. So when you saw an expression like this, you you were required to pass the whole the whole expression as a formal parameter the, as a to substitute it into the formal parameter. And this was one of the uh, one of the more unexpected design choices, let's say. And so when you uh, when you did this. Um, people had uh, spent about a decade experimenting with this, and then going from ALGOL 60 to ALGOL 68, they switched from call by name to call by value. And if you, uh, if uh, you're ever wandering the halls of the computer lab and you see Tony Hoare, you might ask him about this because uh, he, back in the 1960s, was uh, was quite was quite uh, um, unhappy with this decision, but. It was a decision that was made mostly for uh, for efficiency reasons, and also because when you substitute a whole computation, that can make it a bit tricky to figure out uh, exactly when side effects happen. And so the way that we would formalize call by name is um, is quite similar to the way you'd formalize call by value, except that you change the reduction rule slightly. So we would have one congruence rule, which says that when you see an application, you evaluate the left-hand side. So e1, e2 will go to uh, will go to e1 prime e2 if e1 goes to e1 prime. And then instead of having a second congruence rule to evaluate function arguments, we just immediately have a reduction rule. And it says if you see a function and it has an expression as an argument, then just go ahead and sub do the substitution. So if you look right here, you'll see that e2 is not a value. It's a general expression. And it's allowed to be substituted for the formal parameter x. And so now what you can see is when we have this expression, if fn x colon unit goes to skip with l gets assigned to 2 as an argument, um, you immediately substitute l gets assigned to 2 for x, and this thing will then immediately, since x doesn't occur in skip, it will just go to skip, and now you don't evaluate this expression at all. And so the result is that in a call by name language, if you don't use the argument, it doesn't get uh, evaluated. And if it is if it is used, then you'll evaluate it on each occurrence. And this is actually why it, uh, it was it was specified the way it was in Algol 60, because the the language designers had the idea that you could think of control structures like conditionals and while loops as functions which received a piece of code as an argument. And so if in a while loop, if you receive the body as an argument, you want to evaluate the body repeatedly until the loop condition is, is false. And so that was, th that was their motivation for this. And it's a little bit surprising that, you know, higher order functional programming was, was on the agenda in 1959, but it was. Okay, so call by name is not used much anymore in modern imperative languages, but a variant of it called call by need is still used in the functional programming language Haskell. And so in Haskell, it uses the call, call by name evaluation strategy, except that it doesn't evaluate expressions uh, repeatedly. It, if you, you substitute a expression unevaluated, uh, for a parameter, just like in call by name, but there's some memoization that goes on so that if it's evaluated uh, twice, if it's evaluated once, you'll you save the uh, you save the value and you never evaluate it a second time. And so what this means is that in Haskell, the this principle of you don't evaluate an argument unless it's actually used lets you build infinite data structures in a very convenient way. So here is an uh, implementation in Haskell of the famous sieve of Eratosthenes. And so what it does is it, we first define on this line a function not divisible y. And it just says, OK, um, you check if y mod x is not equal to 0 to implement not divisible by. And then we have a function enum from which generates the integers starting from uh, starting from the argument n that you pass it. So it'll say if you give if you call enum from uh, n, it'll give you a list whose first element is n and whose tail is enum from n plus one. And the thing to notice is that in a language like OCaml, this would immediately trigger an infinite loop. 
but in Haskell it doesn't because these uh, these expressions are evaluated lazily. They're not uh, evaluated until they're used. So if you want to see the infinite loop in uh, in in OCaml, what you can do is uh, we let's try to define enum from, and if we try to define n constant to enum from n plus one. There's no problem defining the function. It's a function that takes an integer and gives you an integer list. But if you try to actually call it, you get a stack overflow. Because you never actually have a base case in this expression. But in Haskell, it works fine. And you get a lazy list of, uh, of the integers starting from n. And then once you have this, we can define the sieve function. And what it does, the, which, which will enumerate all the primes. And what it'll do is, you'll, you, if you, take a, a, if you t generate a sieve, you take the first element of the, uh, of the uh, list of inputs, and then you filter the tail by all, uh, filtering out everything divisible by the first element. And then, so if you gave it the number starting from two, you cons two onto applying sieve to all of the non uh, all of the odd numbers, and then when you when you apply sieve to that tail, you'll find that three is is not divisible by two, and now you filter out everything that's divisible by three from the remaining lists. And so when you evaluate it, you're going to get the infinite sequence of prime numbers. And so. You can, you can use this lazy call by name evaluation in order to program very conveniently with infinite uh, data structures. And so in Haskell, you don't need a special iteration protocol the way that you do in languages like Python or Java. Um, you just use a list and your list is your iterator because it, it's perfectly happy to generate unbounded numbers of elements and it'll never evaluate the tail of a list until it's actually used. Okay, and so the point here is that Haskell is able to use this optimization of call by name. It's call by need because it's a pure language. So the Algol designers back in 1960 had the idea that with call by name, you could implement imperative control structures by reevaluating arguments multiple times to implement things like while loops. And in Haskell, because it is a pure programming language, it has no ambient side effects like IO or state update or things like this. Um, evaluating the same expression twice will always give you the same value. And so as a result, there's, there's no need to evaluate the expression more than once. So if you use it, you evaluate it, and then you can save the result until you need it again. And so they, they get a, a, a substantial optimization out of this use of purity. Okay, but this is again not the only choice of evaluation strategy. And so there is another choice which is called full beta reduction. And I warned you, uh, I warned you in the previous lecture that there's a lot of Greek letters, um, not just in the syntax, but in the descri description of these reduction rules. So alpha conversion means renaming formal parameters, and beta reduction means substituting uh, arguments for the formal parameters. And there is no meaning to these names, they're just names. And so the full beta uh, reduction strategy means that both the left and the right hand signs are allowed to reduce, and at any point where the left hand side has a function term replace all the occurrences of the formal parameter by the argument and also what you can do is you can allow reductions inside of lambda so that if you have uh, fn x colon int goes to 2 plus 2 that will can reduce to 4 to fn x goes to 4 so you're allowed to do with full beta reductions inside of the uh, inside of the inside of a lambda and so if you wanted to model the full beta reduction rule, what you can do is you can have two congruence rules, one of which says that uh, if you see E1, E2 applied to E1, E2, and E1 steps to E1 prime, then E1 prime steps to E2. And symmetrically, if uh, E2 steps to E2 prime, then E1, E2 will go to E1, E2 prime. And this is... Um, kind of unusual. And what's what's really unusual here is that this this pair of rules 
breaks determinism. So ever since the uh, second lecture, we've been talking about how all our semantics have been engineered to ensure that the determinism level holds. With full beta reduction, it's no longer true because when you see an application, you have a choice. You, ha you are free to evaluate either the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And for more, furthermore, that's not even the only non-determinism. So with the uh, beta rule for a full beta, Whenever you see a lambda abstraction, you're allowed to do a substitution. And you're also allowed to evaluate under a lambda, uh, un inside the body of a lambda abstraction. So what this means is that you, you're allowed to do any reduction you like anywhere in the program. And this is not a strategy that's actually good for a programming language, but it turns out to be quite useful when you're, uh, when you're implementing things like proof assistance. Because when you're proving, say, that two functions are equivalent, it's useful to be able to say, well, my, my program optimization will let me rewrite this subterm to that subterm, even if it's inside the body of a function. And so it's convenient for, uh, for building mechanized proof assistance to have a system that supports full beta reduction. And so the, the point about full beta reduction is that you have many possible reduction paths. So if we have our expression fnx goes to x plus x applied to 2 plus 2, well, we could evaluate 2 plus 2 and then do the substitution to get us to 8, or we could do substitute the, uh, the argument as, a, as an unevaluated expression, and then we get 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. And when you have that, you have two paths you can evaluate. You can evaluate the left-hand side first, or you can evaluate the right-hand side first. And then either way, you'll get to 4 plus 4, and from that, you'll get to 8. And so you can see the non-determinism very visually here, like each, each path through this graph corresponds to a different evaluation of the, of the program under full beta. And this is also uh, this is also why it's useful for uh, for doing proofs because you can choose the evaluation order um, that's sort of most in, al aligned with the grain of your proof. Um, but it's it's really not uh, um, it's really not used in implementing programming languages because. Um, non-determinism is generally something you want to avoid unless you have no choice because you know a programmer has to have an idea of what the pro of when evaluations happen in order to predict the runtime cost of the program like the space complexity or the time complexity okay and so this isn't even the only variant of beta reduction there's a there is a uh, another ev uh, evaluation strategy called normal order reduction, where you restrict the uh, the rules of full beta to make it a leftmost outermost reduction. So you're allowed to go under the lambda, but you always try to evaluate the left hand side, the uh, the function position first. And so there's many different uh, evaluation strategies, and you know all of them are used in in different contexts, but the dominant uh, evaluation strategy these days is call by value. So this is what OCaml uses, this is what Java uses, this is what Rust uses. Um, practically every mainstream programming language except for Haskell uses call by value. And so what we can do is we can focus our attention on call by value. So we have seen the runtime behavior of functions now, and we've seen the different design choices you have for it. And now what we can do is we can move from the dynamic semantics of functions to their runtime semantic, uh, to, their, to their static semantics or their typing. And so before, what we did was we said we have a typing relation, E has the type T under the assumptions gamma. And so before, gamma gave only the types of the store locations, and it was a partial function, which took a location and gave you the type of that location. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to extend it so that we give assumptions on the types of variables as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take gamma to actually mean a pair. So before, what we had was a type environment was a 
a map from locations to uh, um, to t uh, to t look. So the types of locations. So so far it's only been int refs. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to turn this into a record. So we're going to say, well, that's not enough. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, have one. Uh, we're going to turn it into a record with two fields. And so we're going to say that we want our type environment to be a pair. And the first component of the pair is a is a partial function from locations to the types of locations, and the second component is a map from variables to types. And so when we will refer to the first component as gamma lock, which is the map from locations to uh, location types, and gamma var, which is the partial function from variables to types. And so we might have, for ex example, a gamma loc, which is L1 has the type int ref, and a gamma var, which says X has the type int, and Y has the type bool to int. And so what we will do, so you, when, whenever you see me write something like, uh, like gamma with a subscript loc, this you can read as a sort of, uh, you know, record predict projection, gamma dot loc. And likewise for uh, variables, it's, it's, we can use our record projection to get the second component of this pair. So if you think about the type environments as actually having two functions in them now, one for one mapping locations to their types and one mapping variables to their types, we, we now have our environment being represented as a pair and we can, we'll write gamma sub loc to get the location component, and we'll write gamma sub var to represent the variable component of this pair. And what we will do is we're going to pick a collect, we're going to pick a set of notations in order to work conveniently with this. So we'll write domain of gamma to indicate the union of uh, gamma loc and gamma var. So if I write domain of gamma, what this really means is I want the domain of gamma loc and I want it to be unioned with the domain of gamma var. And so this thing is going to be a subset of locations union Uh, union x, the set of variables. So that's what we're going to write do domain gamma to mean. And if I write something like gamma x colon t, what this means is I want a record where, you know, the location field is going to be uh, the same as before, and the variable field is going to be it's going to it's going to be uh, the old gamma. It's going to be the old gamma var, and we're going to add the mapping. Um, um, X gets mapped to T. So we're going to when I, whenever I write this gamma comma x colon t, what we want is we want the we're going to produce a new environment where the first component, the the location mapping, is the same as before, and the variable mapping um, is going to be the old variable mapping, but augmented with a binding saying that the variable x has the type t. And so what that's what this notation uh, gamma comma x colon t was taken to mean. So it's the pair of gamma loc and the pair partial function which maps x to t but is otherwise like gamma var. And so with this notation in hand what we can do is we can give the typing rules for functions. So what we can do is we can say that um, the variable has x 
has the type t if gamma of x is equal to t. And this, there's a slight abuse of notation here. This should really be gamma sub var of x is equal to t. But often I will omit this because locations and variables are, are disjoint sets. And so if I give gamma a variable as an argument, then really the only thing I could have done is uh, applied it to the gamma sub var. So if we wanted to write the variable rule more carefully, what we could have done is we could have said, okay, gamma dot var of x is equal to t, then gamma, now this, this would be like sort of a more, uh, a more faithful representation of the, uh, um, of the variable rule. But because variables um, are disjoint from locations, as an abuse of notation, I, I'll, I'll sometimes write gamma of x is equal to t. So <coughs> I will sometimes write that because there's uh, no ambiguity. There's two functions here, and only one of them has the right domain. And so then what we can do is for functions, we'll say fn x colon t to e has the type t to t prime when e has the t type t prime in a context which has been extended with x colon t. And so what's going to happen here is that we're going to uh, take x colon t and add it to the context and then we will check that the body has the t prime, has the bot type t prime. And so whenever inside of E we hit a variable, we'll, we'll have it in the context defined so that we know what its type is. And so we'll be able to check that x is used consistently at the type t. And note again here that I'm using the notation which says that I'm writing gamma comma x, comma x colon t to update the variable component of this pair with the binding x gets mapped to t. And so for applications, what we can do is we can say, well, if you see an application e1, e2, then you check that e1 has a function type t to t prime, and you check that the argument e2 has the type t. And if that's true, then the result of the application will be t prime, which is the result of the function type, the result type of the function. Okay, so these three rules are actually enough to type check functions. So if you have an exp expression like fn x colon int goes to x plus 2 applied to 2, well, intuitively, you know that this, uh, that this uh, expression has to have the type integer, but we can, um, un uh, we can get it without any in in intuition by using the typing rules. So this is an application. So we can use the application rule. And the application rule says check the type of the function argument and in this end then check the type of the uh, of the argument to the application and so the argument is 2 and that has the type integer and the function our position is actually a lambda abstraction so it's fn x colon int goes to x plus 2 and we know this has the type int goes to int because we're allowed to add x colon int to the context and now we can check that the body x plus 2 has the type in it int. And because our context contains x colon int, we're, the, we're able to use the variable rule. And we can see that since x colon int is in the context, the variable x has the type integer. And in this extended con uh, context, 2 still has the type int. And so the point here is that the way we've set up these rules, none of the typing rules needed to change, uh, ty uh, need none of the typing rules needed to change at all, except for the ones we added in order to uh, type check functions. And so the, the, um, the main thing that's different now is that as you climb this tree, the, the context gamma can now change. So whenever you go under a, lamb, under a function, you have to add the formal parameter into the context and then check the body. 
And so at different parts of the tree, you'll have different sets of uh, bindings in your context. And that just corresponds to the variable scoping in your program. So now what we can do is we can look at another example. So here we have a, a simple higher order function, fn x of type int to int goes to x is applied to uh, fn x colon int to x gets applied to three. And so what you might want to do is you might want to try working, working this out. And so what we can do is we, let's, let's work this out. So let's assume we're in an empty context and we want to check what type fn x of type int to int goes to x applied to fn x colon int goes to x. So we have the identity function here and we give it three. And so what type does this have? And so let's let's draw the typing derivation to see. And so one, one thing that's, that's uh, often handy to do when you're uh, when you're drawing these typing derivations is to um, use the typing derivation to help you figure out what type should go in the, should be the result of the type. And so you're going to be mimicking the structure of a type inference algorithm. So here we have a function. And so we can use the function typing rule and we can add x of type int to int to our context. And now what we've got is this, this expression right here. And so we still haven't quite decided what it is, except that you can sort of we can sort of peek ahead and we can see that x is of type int int. So we expect this will be the type int. But let's not do that just yet. So now what we're going to do is we have an application, so we can use the application rule. And so the application rule will tell us that we need to find the type of x. And we can look that up in the context and the var rule will tell us it's int to int. And now what we need to do is we need to check that this expression right here has a sensible type as well. So let's draw some more tree here. And so now what we want to do is we want to check that this application is well typed. And so now what we can do is we've got ourselves an application and we need this to be an integer because we're doing an application of int to int. So this thing has to be, this thing right here has to be an integer. So let's check that out and make sure we got it right. But before I do that, what I want to do, uh, oh yeah, so what I want to do is I want to use the application rule. And the application rule is going to say, okay, well, we have fn x goes to three, and now we want this to have some type, and we want the, the same thing over here. Okay, and so now what we're going to see here is that this will have the type int because that's what the type of 3 is. And what we're going to see is before we, before we go any further, what we want to do uh, is it's helpful to rename the variable. So recall that we only consider functions up to alpha conversion so we can just rename this x to y because that's an equivalent expression and now we don't have to worry about uh, uh, having two x's in the context. And so this is going to become x int to int and we'll have y of type int and we want to find out what type y has. And so y 
is a variable that's in the context and it's going to have the type int by the var rule. And so this whole thing will have the type int to int. Let me try to compress these a little bit in order to make it to keep it from overflowing the, the margins. Okay, success. Okay, and so now you can see that we have a full typing derivation for this expression. So we have uh, fn y to y has the type int to int, and the argument 3 has the type int, so this thing has to have the type int. And so now again we have a function int to int and an argument int, so this has to have the type int, and then finally the whole thing has to have the type int. And so we have a typing derivation for this expression. And so you can see that you didn't really need to think very much, you just needed to push things into the context, and in order to keep all the variables in the context distinct from one another, it's sort of convenient to rename, rename variables as you go along. Okay, and so for properties, so we have a type system and we have a dynamic semantics, and we need to check that they these two things have some relationship to one another. And so when you establish type safety, um, the idea is that type safety refers to the execution of a whole closed program. So we're going to consider executions of closed programs with no free variables. So languages like OCaml and Java, you never evaluate under a Lambda expression. And so that means that if you have a whole program, it's not going to be under any binders. And so for type safety, it's enough to consider closed programs. So that have no free variables. And if they have no free variables, then what that means is that the domain of the, the that the context gamma is only going to contain um, binding uh, types for locations. So the variable part of this uh, of this gamma is going to be empty. And so what we can say is if E is a closed program, which is typed at type T under a gamma whose domain is the subset of a uh, runtime store, then either E is a value or there exist E and S, E prime and S prime such that E S takes a step. So this is almost the same um, correctness statement that we had before. Um, all that's different now is that uh, um, we add the additional con uh, constraint on this program on the on this program that it's a closed program with no free variables. So we have a closed and whole program are sort of are sort of synonymous here. And so what we're saying is that if you have no free variables, then uh, the program is going to behave much like the L1 program did. As long as your program is well typed with a set of uh, locations that's a subset of the actual set of locations, then either the program has finished evaluating or it can take another step. And so the, the only thing that's different in your proof is now that there are going to be some more stuck configurations. So for instance, if you have four applied to three, then your program is stuck because three is not a function. Um, but regardless, the, type, the progress proof will show that you don't hit any of these stuck configurations. Then we're also going to, we'll also need to extend the type preservation lemma. And so again, we're going to have to add this condition that E is a closed expression and that the type environment gamma doesn't have any free bindings for free variables in it. So the domain of gamma is a subset of the domain of the runtime store. So if you know that you have a well-typed program with no free variables um, and you know that it actually takes a step, then you know that the thing it took a step to is still well typed, and the thing it stepped to is still closed, and the domain of gamma is still a subset of the domain of S prime. And so we needed to add one additional uh, condition in the, in the result of the type preservation lemma. We needed to show that not only is E prime still well typed, we also needed to establish that it is still closed. But once we've done that, we'll be able to establish type safety because, you know, if you start with a, uh, a well-typed closed program, it's either a value or it can take a step. 
And if it did take a step, then type preservation tells you it's still well typed and it's still closed. So the progress lemma still applies to the result of taking that step. Okay, and so how do we prove type preservation? And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to uh, we're going to do this on the reduction relation as before by induction uh, rule induction on the reduction relation, and we will take the uh, induction hypothesis to to say that if for all gamma and t, if gamma is tells us that E has well typed and E is closed and the domain of gamma is a subset of S, then E prime is well typed. E prime is closed, and the domain of gamma is a subset of the domain of S prime. So that's what our induction hypothesis is going to be. And note that we have some quantifiers in this induction hypothesis. Um, then you'll be able to show that for all E, S, E prime, S prime, and E, S transitions to E prime, S prime, that implies the induction hypothesis by rule induction. So we'll be able to appeal to rule induction um, and show that every reduction that this reduction rule uh, uh, that these reduction rules generate is going to preserve is going to preserve typing. And when uh, when you prove this, one of the lemmas that you're, you're going to need one new lemma, and this lemma is the substitution lemma, which says that if E is well typed under T, and E prime has the type T prime in a context gamma extended with X colon T. Uh, then gamma will tell you that E for X and E prime has the type T prime. So remember that the, the, key, the key operation in the operational semantics for functions is the reduction rule for function applications. And so let's pop back just a little bit. And so in our call by value reduction, we say, okay, if you have a function, fn x colon t goes to e, and it has an argument v, then you evaluate by doing this substitution. And so when you extend the type uh, preservation proof, what will happen is you hit this case, and you want to show, and you know this application has the type t prime, and you want to show that the result also has the type t prime. And so because you're doing a substitution of a well-typed term into another well-typed term, we have to prove a substitution theorem that shows that that substitution um, maintains, maintains typing. And so this is the critical lemma that will let you prove type safety for a language with functions and uh, variables in it. And it's saying that a variable respects the variables and substitution respects the uh, the typing relation so we take we take our uh, if you have an expression with a formal x in it and you have a term of type t you are allowed to substitute e for x into e prime because and and you'll still have the type t prime because everywhere that the variable rule occurs you can plug in the derivation of e colon tau. So it's, it's sort of an operation of surgery on trees again. Um, and finally, one, uh, one property which doesn't hold of L2, but does hold of certain, uh, certain type lambda calculi is the property of normalization. So if you, if, uh, actually it does hold for this language for L2. So if you removed while loops and store operations from this language, then if you have a closed term, then um, the, it doesn't have an infinite reduction sequence. That is, it will always reduce to a closed value. Um, and if you try to prove this by induction, you'll get stuck. And if you're really curious how to prove it, you can either look in chapter 12 of the Pierce book, or you can take type systems next year. Okay, and so now we've introduced basic functions to this programming language, but in the next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how to implement recursive definitions. So, so far we've just added basic lambdas, but we haven't, we haven't talked about self-referential or recursive functions. And that's what we're going to do in the next lecture. So I'll see you then. Bye.